Hi everybody, welcome to San Francisco. This is theCUBE's coverage of RSA Conference 2024. Thanks for being with us. Shelly Kramer and David Linthicum, both of theCUBE Research. We're really excited, four days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We start here Monday evening. We've got a, a cocktail event that we're doing with the New York Stock Exchange. We have so many guests. This is an amazing show. Pre-COVID, it was probably 45, 50,000. Yeah. Um, and it's, I think it's getting close to back it's up back. here. And yeah, it feels that way. Uh -huh. You know, we're here in Moscone. We're in Moscone West, so if you're, if you're around, stop by and see us. Look at this market, guys, just, it's like the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> and I, I say that tongue in cheek, because it really is an insidious situation where you have the adversaries are so highly capable. Yeah. Um, and you've got, we're spending, let's, say, let's call it $150 billion a year. You know, the recent ETR survey data suggests that a vast majority of, of enterprises are spending more than 5%, increasing their budgets by more than 5%. I mean, David, I, I'm seeing budgets increasing 10 to 12% on cybersecurity, whereas the overall budgets are increasing, you know, maybe, let's call it, Mid threes, mm -hmm. okay, so, yeah. so we, every year we spend more, but we feel less safe. As a, <laughs> as a, as a former CTO, how do you feel about that? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's going to be something we're going to have to contend with today, is walking around the show and, and having a conversation with lots of CISOs, and one of the things they're concerned about is, is they're here to figure out how to justify the budget <laughs> increases yeah. that they're going to need to protect the data. They have generative AI coming at them, they have multi-cloud building up, things are getting more complex, they're leveraging on-premise systems. They understand that the cloud's not necessarily the destination for everything, it's going to be part of the infrastructure, so they can't really move anything there and then try to secure it there. So they need to figure out how to deal with this complexity. It's money, 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 and it's going to be a lot more resources to get at this thing. Yeah, so Shelly, uh, I mean, and we've seen just the dynamics over the year, it's just ping-ponging between the adversaries and the good guys, and it, it just, it seems like no matter how much we spend, you know, you look back, are you, do you feel safer at the end of the year? <laughs> Why do you think that is, that we, I mean, first of all, are we closing the gap or is it just going to be a perpetual arms race? We're not closing the gap and I don't think that we will close the gap. I mean, I think this is a continuous game of whack-a-mole. And as excited as we all are, there's not a conversation that any of us have, there's not an event we attend where AI and Gen AI doesn't you know, lead the conversation. And as excited as all of us and, and enterprises and, and you know, every size organization on down are about how to leverage AI, um, so are threat actors. And they're very motivated because the better they get at this, the more money they stand to make. So I, I don't know that, I personally don't see there ever going to be a time where we're like, oh, we got this. In 2022, uh, at Palo Alto Ignite, uh, Palo Alto near Zook, uh, Nikesh Aurora, made a very strong case for how Palo Alto is the consolidator. That on average, and you hear this at CrowdStrike conferences, here at all conferences, on average there's between 50 and 75 tools installed at large enterprises, and, and there's a skills gap. And so the premise that Palo Alto put forth, and again, others do as well, CrowdStrike and others, is that we're going to be able to consolidate that down, simplify. Last quarter, Palo Alto came out and said, well, there seems to be spending fatigue. You know, the consolidation is, you know, maybe the ROI is not there. Palo Alto, or rather CrowdStrike said, well, we're not seeing that. Zscaler, Jay Chaudhry's who's coming on here, said we're not seeing that. Yeah. But then the ETR survey, you know, came out. 51% of the enterprises in a survey of around 320 said they're increasing the number of vendors. Only 9% said they're decreasing, and only 6% said they're decreasing as a function of consolidation. So, is consolidation like a myth, or is it only happening in, in pockets? Why is the vendor narrative so different than what's actually happening in the field. Well, that never happens, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's um, a big surprise. I, ultimately, ultimately, they can consolidate the tools. It's just the, the risk of the fact of the matter is, I mean, Shelley had it right, the, the, the threat actors are growing, growing in power and spanning their power, and so therefore they have to get a number of tools to protect themselves, so they're not going to be able to do some consolidation for at least five years. So it is a myth, it's something you can too. I wouldn't even, I would take it off the radar screen for as far as planning purposes go. Uh, it's, a false, it's a false narrative right now. Why do you think that customers can't consolidate the number of tools vendors? 
Well, I think that they could. I don't know that that's necessarily the best thing for them to do, because I think that this is, as we know, and as anybody who's here today will see, this is a very crowded landscape with some amazing technology solutions out here, and so I think what, what customers are doing is that they're taking best of breed for endpoint and best of breed for this and best of breed and plugging those solutions in. And you know what? Every vendor on the planet would love for every customer to only use their platform. Is that really what's best for customers always? I don't think so. Yeah, it's an age old debate. I know, you know, Zias and I have talked about this. We talked about it at the Palo Alto conference. Can you be a broad portfolio player and best of breed? Do you, do you, do you feel like this is one of those places, you know, George Kurtz has a, a, a saying, he's a good enough, not good enough. Of course, he, he says that because it's, he's going right after Microsoft, mm -hmm. which is his biggest competitor. Uh, but is good enough, not good enough in cyber? Yeah, I think, I think it is. I think ultimately, ultimately this is about specialization and your ability, you just hit the nail on the head, your ability to provide best of breed to do something better than your competitors and not trying to span too much and trying to get at different aspects of the market. This is going to be about integration of a very complex multiplicity of technologies that come together to, to really kind of protect the enterprises moving forward. So it's going to be about vendors who are able to specialize and do something very well. Um, so, you know, it's like the old Ross Perot thing, he used to tell General Motors, let's do something, let's do one thing well, let's make the best brakes, the best tires. And that's exactly what the vendors need to do right now. Right. You have all these countervailing forces in the market, don't you, Shelley? where you have, you know, cloud has become the first line of defense, yet th there's still all kinds of stuff you have to do on-prem. It's a shared responsibility model, so the cloud vendors will only do so much, so you're putting more on developers, you know, this term shift left, that means, that means developers are going to have to, <laughs> you know, secure the infrastructure, which is right. not their favorite thing in the world to do. You have, speaking of consolidation, you have a lot of M&A going on. You look at companies like CrowdStrike, they're buying like crazy. Wiz just acquired Lacework after, I think Lacework raised over a billion dollars, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, pretty amazing. And then the other force you have is all this money being raised. Uh, Island just raised 175 million. Corelight, which is network security, raised 150 million. Uh, the App, App Dynamics co-founder, he got investment from Cities VC arm to start a company called Traceable. Oasis Security, uh, 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 there's a SIM startup, Run, Run Reveal just got you know, a few million bucks. So there's all kinds of startups popping up to fill these holes, to your point, to be best of breed, whether it's API security, IOT security. So it just seems like we're not going to have less complexity, but at the same time, you've got a skills gap. Okay, big question, does AI solve this? In some ways it helps. You know, it doesn't solve it completely. I mean, AI, the technology alone is never the answer. You know, it's the technology working alongside humans. And so I think that, you know, we're seeing there, when you talk about the responsibility on developers to secure the network and to secure the system, I think that AI can play a big role there. Um, can it do it all on its own? Probably not. Um, but I think it will help with augmenting the skills gap. But the bad guys have AI too. They sure do. Right. They're able to use it as a weapon, you have to use it as a defense mechanism. I think it's, it's going to be spy versus spy, it's a 50-50 you know, kind of assembly, we can weaponize it as well as they can, so who can do, who can do it the best? It's the race is on right so now. So how do you think we should think about Gen AI specifically in the context of cybersecurity? Last year at CrowdStrike, uh, they showed Charlotte, which was their you know, natural language you know, interface. You know, show me where my exposures are, write me a, a, a patch, you know, deploy the patch, you know, et cetera. So that was kind of cool. Should we think of this as a, a core technology to solve for cyber, or is it more, do you think, David, an orchest orchestrator across you know, a complex cyber estate? You just hit the nail on the head. We need to use it to mediate the complexity of these various systems that are out there. So the, all these AI systems can't be siloed into themselves if they're going to have value. They need to be communicating one to another, have a coordinated defense platform, even though multiple vendors are part of it. So we have to figure out how to orchestrate these generative AI systems to turn them into a defense mechanism that's going to be effective. You know, Shelly, I want to get you taken this. Frank Slupin once said to me, and I think he wrote this in his book, uh, Amp It Up. If you, got, if you got 10 priorities, you have none. So I'm, I'm loving this survey from ETR where they said, what's your priority? You know, what are the areas that are highest priority? Everything. And it's like single sign-on, MFA, vulnerability management and patching, endpoint, EDR, XDR, observability, um, yeah. SIM, a AV, antivirus, network security, Z, zero trust. All of these have like 
very, very high priorities. You know, web application uh, firewalls, SASE, cloud security, posture management. And there's like 15 priorities. That's why they need so, more budget. Yeah, but so, but, <laughs> but, but we've seen that, well, I, I wouldn't say, there is a correlation. I presume if you spend more, you're, you're going to have better tooling, better infrastructure, better people, but it, it just seems like that gap never closes. No. No. So, you know, it's interesting too on the scale gap, uh, the skills gap standpoint. Um, as you know, I think your kids are a little bit older than mine, but my kids are just getting ready to start college, and um, tons of young people are majoring and graduating in computer science, cybersecurity focused degrees, and they're having a heck of a time getting jobs. And so, what's really interesting about that? So, I see your brow furrow, right? That doesn't make sense. Well, yeah. it does make sense because. Even though you have this pool of new workers, they don't have any experience. So that's really, you know, so we've got this machine that's turning out this new generation of tech workers, but yet they don't quite have the ability to slide in where they're most needed. So it's an interesting industry challenge. Yeah, and we need to think differently in terms of how we train people. Yeah. The colleges and universities probably need to do a better job in how we're doing it, and it should be on-demand, continuous training, mm -hmm. continuous learning that comes forward, and you have to change the dimension of that. Yeah. Right now, education is too expensive, we're not getting the out outcome and the value out of it, yeah. and we need to start producing people that are more applicable for the job market, to your point. Yeah, absolutely. So the other thing is, so 50% of the uh, uh, respondents in this survey are attending RSA, so it was a great sample of, yeah. you know, kind of representative of who's here, and they asked them, what are the, what are the things that you're most interested in learning at RSA, and, and of course AI was number one, AI security and zero trust <laughs> network. I want to ask about zero trust, David, Explain from your perspective, how should we think about zero trust? You don't buy it, <laughs> you know, it's a set of practices, set of standards, so you sort of build it, it's cultural. Uh, what are you seeing in, in the community in terms of how organizations are adopting zero trust? It, it's, it's the standard, it's baked into everything. So it doesn't really, it, it doesn't really resonate with anybody anymore. When you talk about zero trust, they hear, they hear dolphin squeaks. They, <laughs> they've heard it before. So at the end of the day, we need, we need to build this technology in there in certain ways, and certainly these approaches and best practices are fundamental to the way and build the technology. Zero trust is going to be fundamental to that. We just need to figure out how to apply it to single sign-on, into AI, into everything that we're discussing, all the different silos of technology that are being put in there. So how do we do this thing in an orchestrated way where these things are coming together, we were going to have a holistic value that comes out of our security system with zero trust capabilities built into the system. That's a harder problem to solve. Yeah, and 11% and of the respondents in the survey said they've, they've achieved, our organization is fully deployed on a zero trust model. That's hard to believe. It, you is. Know, it is. really you is. You know, you would think that, that you're, it's kind of never ending, first of all. Now maybe there's some small organizations who have, who have gotten there, there's a you know, two person startup, everything's zero trust, but, but, but when you talk to CISOs, they, they seem to be leaning into the concept, right? Yeah. Maybe because it's such a buzzword, uh, but it is a journey, it's going to take a long time to get there, and, and essentially you never get there. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking about digital transformation is the same thing. I mean, you're never done with your digital transformation journey. It's a journey, and as technology evolves, you evolve and adapt, and that's really the world that we're living in. I don't see how zero trust can be any different. I mean, we're going to continue to see an evolution of tech, of tools, of capabilities. You're not going to be done. So what are you guys looking for at, uh, at RSA this year? You, it's, it's early, you poked around a little bit. Uh, based on your, what are your initial impressions and what are you hoping to see? Big, big thing is how are we solving the AI problem? That's the fundamental question this year today. I know it's obvious, but uh, everybody out there has that question. They're asking me that question and people are here to find the answers of it. And what are the experts saying that the answers are? And is it consistent from one expert to the other? And what are the vendors doing to adjust to finding certain solutions with the technology? Also looking at and you, the, it, the, the complexity of the existing enterprises, how do we secure that? The ability to deal with heterogeneity in such a way where we can secure it in a way that's going to be scalable and it's going to provide growth around the enterprise. And at the same time, how are we going to do this to minimize the amount of costs that's going to be associated with it? Because the CISOs are concerned because they're not, they're asking for more money, they're not getting more money. And so, how are they going to protect the data, this new AI assets, things like that, using the existing budgets with very slow growth at the, with the rate of, uh, of IT spending that's going on right now? So they need to weaponize, they need to buy different technologies 
they're concerned about which technologies to buy, how they're going to pay for it, how they're going to get the skills to make it happen, and they're here to finding that out. I want to find that out too. You know, that cost piece is really important. It's, look, the business case on cyber is a reduction in expected loss. It's a reduced risk. So that doesn't directly throw off cash to, from the CFO standpoint. So it's hard to make cyber self-funding, isn't it? It is, <laughs> and I, I can always define the value of what security is, but it doesn't have value. It's, it's, what, it's a soft value. You can't define it as something that you can put in the bank. And uh, that becomes the difficulty there. But it's the same thing with agility and all these other things that, that uh, IT uh, really kind of develops as a, as a value that's very hard to define. But we have to learn how to put a value around security, go to the boards of directors and saying, we can deliver this much value with this much money. And we need to consist, this is the metrics we're going to use to measure our success moving forward. Give us this much money, we'll deliver that value. That deal needs to be made. Shelly, what are you looking for? Well, you know, the same thing. I think that, you know, some of this ETR data showed that, you know, only well, while 47% of their survey respondents said they utilize AI um, in from one to 10% of their security tools. That's a tiny, tiny amount. So I think that, like David, I mean, and all of us here, that's what we're really looking for. How are you really using AI? What vendor solutions are out there that make the most sense? And really, um, kind of who's really checking the bottom line as it relates to AI security? Because I think that, that I mean, that's the world that we are immersed in all day, every day. Yeah, I agree, I want to see what's real in AI yeah. and what's sort of AI washing. The other thing about RSA is, I'm always fascinated by the creativity of the hackers. Like, <laughs> you know, the, the new ways in which they're coming up with, with you know, ways to penetrate organizations, yeah. whether it's you know, new phishing scams, but what they do with that, you know, we saw the supply chain hacks a couple of years ago that were exceedingly novel, you know, go all the way back to Stuxnet, where kind of got the whole thing going. And uh, guys, thanks so much for helping us kick off RSA 2024, and thank you for watching. You're watching theCUBE's ongoing coverage of RSA Conf at Moscone, we're at Moscone West. Keep it right there for more action. This is day one from theCUBE.